Well, praise the Lord. It's good to be here and good to see you here. Praise God, every one of you. Hallelujah. Well, I want to turn over to the book of Psalms this morning, the ninth chapter, and actually just one single verse of Scripture we'll begin with this morning. And uh, it's, it's uh, not a very lighthearted text. In fact, what God has laid on my heart for this morning is, is in fact pretty intense. But we are living in very intense times. Now, I'm going to take the text. It's in Psalms 9 and 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell and every, all the nations that forget God. And I'm dealing with all the nations that forget God. We know, we know that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. We know that. We know that, that hell itself is simply in holding place until uh, that great white throne judgment where the, when death and hell itself shall be cast into the lake of fire and all whose names are not found written in the Lamb's book of life shall be cast into that lake of fire which burneth with fire and brimstone. We know that. We're well aware of that. But here is a statement that talks about the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Our nation is in grave danger today. You know, the things that, uh, that are, are taking place in our nation. Now, our nation has been moving away from, from God for a full generation and maybe more, but we go back all the way back to, I think it's 1963, which was actually about three or four years before the beginning of this last generation when prayer was taken out of our schools by the Supreme Court. And we need to understand that it's our Supreme Court, not the present court. I do believe the present court possibly is one of the best we've had in my lifetime. And I do believe, and it's shown so far to be one that will protect the church and the people of God, you know, when issues rise against it to the best of their ability. But our nation was destroyed by the Supreme Court of the land. In 1963, they, they took prayer out of the schools. In 1973, they made abortion legal in every state throughout the land. Uh, they called the, the, well, they called it the right to choose, but really they gave the right to murder, you know, to, for mothers to murder their unborn children in the womb. And over 60 million have perished in the womb since 1973. And we can come forward, I don't know the exact dates, but it's our Supreme Court that gave pornographers uh, the freedom of expression that they called pornography their, their uh, freedom of speech, that they were free to publish it. And it's our Supreme Court that gave them that right. And uh, you can go through all many different issues, you know, along the years. But finally, in 2015, the Supreme Court uh, uh, made... Gay marriage, marriage between a man and a man and between a woman and a woman to be the law of the land. And you can see that the Supreme Court of our nation in, in years past has totally destroyed our nation. Now, in, in November uh, 2016, that was the morning after uh, the election of Donald Trump, Donald Trump was not my favorite candidate, but he's the one I voted for because I, I wanted Ted Cruz, but we didn't get Ted Cruz. We got Donald Trump. And the next morning, I woke and I heard these words, I will restore thy judges as at the beginning. 
And I thought that possibly that was a promise of restoration to America. Well, he did exactly what God said he would do. I'm talking about God. He said, I will restore thy judges at the beginning. And uh, Donald Trump, as president, gave us close to 200 uh, conservative judges in courts uh, across the nation and three conservative originalist uh, justices on the Supreme Court giving us a conservative majority for the first time in decades, maybe in my lifetime, that, that we've had such. But at the same time, we see the spirit of Antichrist taking control of our nation. And what the Supreme Court started and may not be able to end, you know, what they started uh, has been taken up, you know, by one of the political parties, and they are turning our nation away from God to forget God. Now, there's one thing that I need to point out about this scripture. It says, all the nations that forget God. Uh, over in, in the, the, the epistles, of, I think maybe it's Peter that spoke this, but, but it says it would be better that you'd never known than to have known and to turn away. That's correct with uh, individuals, and that's correct with nations. It's better that a nation had never known the Lord than to have known the Lord and to turn away from Him. And uh, that's what this scripture is saying here. It's the nations that forget God. Now, there are nations that have never known God. Na you know, big nations, powerful nations that have never known God. And Japan, until World War II, which was the great enemy that, that was near, you know, taking over the world. And who knows what would the outcome would have been if not to, for the, the atomic bomb that was dropped on two of their cities. And they, they, they shown, the, the uh, military people had shown that it would cost millions of lives to have defeated Japan without that bomb. That bomb was a horrible, horrible thing to drop upon a city. Oh, what a choice to destroy 200,000 lives in a moment of time. But it saved millions of lives. Such was that. But yet, yet uh, that nation had never known God. China has never known God. Not in the history of, of, of the world and do we have a record that China has ever known God. They, they've been uh, idolatrous people from, I'm talking about the religious of China, uh, Buddhist and etc. I do remember probably not over 20 years ago that, uh, that they were telling us that so many people were being saved in China that by now China would have been a Christian nation. But what became of that? I mean, really, what became of that? There's so much religious propaganda that we listen to. You know, the great move of God. But in this last day, Jesus said, said when they said, yea, over here or over there, said, believe it not. Believe it not. I can remember, I can remember a few years, maybe 30 years ago, when uh, I believe it was Kenneth Copeland said that they had proven that, that every dollar would save a soul in Africa. Said at the rate we're going, the entire nation of Africa will be Christian in just a few years' time. But well, what happened to that? You know, where did that go? What happened? Why didn't it happen? Because it was propaganda. It was propaganda. And, and, and so... Uh, but there's those nations that have never known God that God uses to punish those nations that turn away from God. You can see that China is like a, a, another Babylon. And I'm not at all calling China mystery Babylon. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. But I'm just telling you that it's like another uh, Babylon that came down to punish Jerusalem when Jerusalem turned away from God. The Jews forsook God. 
the nation of Israel forsook God and and God sent the prophets to warn them, to plead with them, to turn again. Isaiah, let the wicked forsake his ways. Let him turn unto the Lord, for he will abundantly pardon. But they would not turn back. They would not. They went headstrong in their own way. And so God used a nation that had never known God to punish them. And then, of course, as is usually the case, after that nation is punished, the nations that forget God, they themselves also are destroyed. That was the case with Egypt. Egypt uh, oppressed the children of God. They weren't used to punish them, but they oppressed them and were later destroyed for it. And all the nations that oppressed the people of God were later destroyed for it. But God has used ungodly nations to punish the nations that forget God. Keep your eye on China because they are coming up and America is coming down at this present time. It's a sad thing. We have an administration in power that's going to weaken our military, that's going to, that is already weakening the resolve of the people. Close to half of the nation uh, are, are, are socialist, uh, leaning towards communism themselves, uh, seeking, seeking uh, communion with their great enemy in the world. You know, uh, merchandise with them and commerce with them and so forth, seeking to make peace with them through uh, 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 agreeing with them and compromising with them. But I'm telling you that America, America is being turned into hell right now. Because America is a nation that has forgotten God, has forgotten God. There's another enemy on the horizon, and that would be the locust army. In the ninth chapter of Revelation, it talks about an army of, what is it, a, a uh, hundred million, two hundred million, two hundred million army. It's a locust army. It's radical Islam. Uh, army being raised right now of 200 million. It's not a, it's not a formal army. It, 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 it's not a national sponsored army. It's a religious sponsored army. Radical Islam. Every member, every member that's radicalized is a member of that 200 million army. And the scripture says that they, before this time is over, will destroy, will slay a third part of all men. Of course, now, when it says of all men, that's not saying you ladies are safe. That's talking about mankind. That's talking about mankind. And before, read it in the ninth chapter of, uh, of Revelation, that they are prepared for a time to slay the third part of people. And that's radical Islam. It, it's... Uh, been subdued. It was subdued for about four years. We remember five, six years ago that, uh, that they were murdering Christians in, in Syria and in, in Iraq, you know, about a hundred at a time, slitting their throats, letting their bodies fall to the ground to bleed out, to, you know, putting them in cages, burning them with fire, dropping them in the ocean to drown a hundred at a time. They were murdering Christians and other minority religions. And what a horrible thing it was. They controlled uh, about half of Iraq and Syria five to six years ago. But the last administration brought an end to that. And, and that was over. And it seems like it, that Islam was in recession. But now then, it's going to come back strong. Radical Islam is going to come back strong because this administration has opened the way for radical Islam to migrate, legal migration, into our nation. What a horrible, horrible thing that is. But we are a nation along with the Western world, uh, the European nations. Germany was the, the, the heart of the Reformation the 16th century. Now that's 500 years ago. But one of the greatest revivals that ever came came to Germany. 
But yet look what happened to Germany. You know, back in World War II with the rise of Hitler and so forth. And, and uh, England, you know, there's a Protestant movement moved and centered in England and the other European nations for years and years. The beautiful cathedrals that were built, you know, hundreds of years ago, you know, in these nations that have now become atheistic and Islamic nations by large part. They've forgotten God. They've forgotten God. And every nation that forgets God shall be turned into hell. America, this year, for the first time in the history of America, statistically, it's proven that, that um, church membership, that's membership, but that's, membership is always larger than attendance. That's always larger than attendance. But church membership has fallen below 50% of Americans for the first time for in the history of America. Does that mean that America has forgotten God? Oh my, it's a strong indication that less than 50% or even members of churches much less in attendance to the churches. And every nation that forgets God shall be turned into hell. Christians, you that know the Lord, you that love the Lord, we've got to understand that for years we preached and we preached and we preached to stand up and preach the gospel and, and stand for the truth and not be ashamed to save the church. But now then, we must stand up for the salvation of our nation. You know, because it's being turned into hell right now. You know, I'm not talking about the burning fiery pit. I mean, the nation is becoming a hell on earth right before our eyes. Listen to me. And sadly, there's so many people that are totally unconcerned about it. But keep this in mind. Scripture says the wicked shall be turned into hell. Now that's individuals. That's all the wicked Shall be turned. That's talking about that lake of fire and all nations that forget God. I want to go over to uh, Second Peter, Second Peter, the second chapter and the fourth verse. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. Look at that. Not only the nations that forget God shall be turned into hell, but here he spared not the angels that sinned. What did he cast the angels in, into hell for? What did he cast them into hell for? Sin. Sin. They sinned. Well, we know their sin was rebellion against God. My, my, what's America's sin? Rebellion against God. But here, he says, if God spared not, look at that word, if. Look at that word, if. It means something. It's, it's very powerful in this verse. If God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world. If God spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Look at that. If God spared not the old world, and bring, brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly, if, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, if God turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. Can, can you see that the if follows all the way through here? If he turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, over condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that should after 
live ungodly. That last major decision of the Supreme Court in destroying America made us a sodomite nation. It made us a sodomite nation, a nation just like, a, you know, just like Sodom and Gomorrah. This president, in his first or second day in office, you know, made a decree, a decree that, uh, that boys that think they're girls could compete with girls in sports events and use the same dressing rooms and restrooms as the girls. That's a sodomite nation. That's a horrible thing. You know, what's in the ascendancy right now? It's the LGBT community is in ascendancy in America, and the church is in descendancy, if you understand what I'm talking about. But look at these ifs. If he spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. Spare, if he spared not the old world, bringing the flood upon the world of the ungodly. If he turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, making them an example unto those who should live after live ungodly. Listen to me. It's a warning. A warning. And delivered just lot vexed with the filthy conversation that wicked. For that righteous man dwelleth among them, seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and reserve the unjust under the day of punishment to be judgment to be punished but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government presumptuous are they self-willed they're not as afraid to speak evil of dignities whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord now then Twelfth verse, but we'll go back and remind you of something. Go back to the, if God spared not the angels that sinned. If God spared not the old world, but brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly. If God turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them, making them an overthrow, and made them an example of those that should live ungodly. And these, these three ifs, these three ifs are never answered. Peter here was little like I am sometime. I'll get to preaching, get way out here on something, and forget where I was going. I mean, that happens. I mean, 81 years of age, and that'll happen to you when you get there probably. Praise God. Still got a sound mind, you know, but uh, just kind of lose track. Well, Peter seems to have lost track of what he was saying, because the word if requires a counterpart. You know, if God spared not the angels, how's he going to spare you? How's he going to spare America? If God spared not the angels, if God spared not the old world, how's he going to spare the nations that forget God? How's he, how's he going to spare the wicked? If he spared not, if he turned the cities of Sodom into ashes, how's he going to spare a nation that's given himself over to sodomy, perversion, uh, unnatural desires and lust? How's he going to spare that in this day? But really, he has even a different target in this second chapter of Second Peter. He said, but these are natural brute beast made to be taken, destroyed, speak evil of things they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart they've exercised <coughs> with covetous practices, cursed children, 
which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, fallen the way of Balaam, the son of Bozar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Now, who's he talking about? These are the other side of the if. These are the other side. If he spared not the angels, but cast them down to hell, the angels that sinned. If he spared not the old world, but brought the flood in on the ungodly, but spared Noah. If he turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, as an example to the ungodly, and yet spared Lot. Oh my, he brings these ifs and the counterpart of them we just read about. Who are they? Go back to the first verse of this chapter. For there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the word is contradicting the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth and their damnation slumbereth not. These are the other side of the coin. When he says, if he spared not the angels, how is he going to spare these? If he spared not the, uh, the, the old world, how is he going to spare these false teachers, false prophets, false apostles in the church that's called by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? How is he going to spare these? Listen to me. He said, many shall follow the pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be over spo evil spoken of, and through covetousness <coughs> shall they with feigned words, pretended, made up, you know, lies, make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation. Oh my. He goes on. He said, they have eyes, for 14th verse, have eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sins. Cannot cease from sins. Does that sound like the mantra of the modern church? We're all sinners. We sin every day. Cannot cease from sins. You know in this book concerning sin, there's two kinds of people in this book. There are those, according to 1 John 3 and, and 9, who cannot sin. Did you know there's a people who cannot sin? Did you know that? It, it, it's, it didn't say there's a people that simply do not sin, that have the possibility of not sinning, that if they try hard enough, they, they can stop sinning, you know, no, there's a people that the scripture says they can not sin. Now, that doesn't mean that if you believe on Jesus, that sin is no longer sin. No, that means that if you trust in the Lord, know the truth and trust in him, sin will be taken away. He's the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. It's taken out of the heart and the nature of those that trust God. You can be a preacher and say, preacher, you're mistaken. Tell John he's mistaken. Tell Paul he's mistaken. Tell the apostles they were mistaken. Listen, because we say only what they said. And John said this. He said, whosoever is born of God, doth not commit sin. And there's thousands of teachers and preachers in churches across America that tell you the word commit means that we don't practice sin. 
But if John had wanted to say we don't practice sin, he'd have used the Greek word presso. But instead he used the Greek word poio, which refers to a single act. Look it up in your strong concordance. Don't sit there and say that can't be true. That is true. That is true. He said they cannot sin because they're born of God. But they're those, and I'm not talking about uh, just sinners in the world and, you know, and the ungodly of the world. But in the churches, in the churches that Peter said, he said, have eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. Now I've preached this and I've had people actually come to me and said, well, Brother Surface, I can cease from sin. Then why haven't you? If you can, you're doubly damned. You receive the greater damnation if you can and you don't. Can you see that? If you can and you... But the fact is, if you're sinning, you cannot cease from sin. It takes a Savior. It takes seeing Him as He is. I, I, I had, a, had a dream or vision from the Lord a couple of weeks ago. And it's strange and I hate to even mention it now. But everybody, the ministers and the people, was receiving a brand new Cadillac. And it, I thought I was giving it to them, but I certainly can't give, I couldn't give one of them, not even to myself. But every one of them had the same key. And I thought, my goodness, if everything has the same key, nothing's safe. And so I got busy trying to change the keys on, on looks like a hundred Cadillacs or hundreds of them. Got to change these keys, get them so they'll be safe. And then I realized, no, there's something more valuable than a new Cadillac that's given to us. It's the unsearchable riches of Christ, which is Christ Himself. And there's only one key. There's not two Gospels. There's not three Gospels. There's only one key to obtaining the, 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 the uh, unsearchable riches of Christ, which is Christ. Only one key. Praise God. Hallelujah. That it'll open the kingdom of God to every person. Praise God that'll believe it and trust in Christ. Praise God. But if you're trying another key, it ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. Every one of that multitude without number used the same key. <laughs> Precious Savior. It was Christ and Him crucified. Hallelujah. Precious Savior. But uh, he, he said they, they cannot sin. He said they cannot sin. Where was that? <laughs> Precious Savior. Oh, yeah, I was looking in the third chapter. Eyes full of adultery that cannot sin, beguile and unstable souls and heart that have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, so on, and, and, and forsaken the right way. They've forsaken the Lord. They've forsaken God. They've forsaken Him. But their teachers, ministers, apostles, prophets in the churches that have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Do you know what this means? They'll preach whatever it takes to get more money. Whatever it takes to get more money, that's what they preach. They follow the way of, of Balaam. The way of Balaam, the son of Bozar. Balaam was a prophet in the Old Testament who Balak, an enemy king to Israel, hired Balaam to prophesy a curse upon the children of Israel. And Balaam took the money, took the gold, and went down to curse them. But he found out that he could not curse. He could not curse that which God had blessed. 
Oh my, that's still true. That's still true. The incident I faced years ago, somebody's trying to bring a curse upon me and, and, and actually take away our television ministry, which was sponsored by Channel 22. They're trying to take that away from us, you know, cause it to be taken from us. And uh, they, they brought in a, a prophet that was a friend of them. They're going to let the prophet speak. And I was afraid to enter into to a prayer closet with this prophet and this man that was seeking to, to uh, curse me. And along with Brother Eldred Thomas, the owner of Channel 22. But Brother Thomas, recognizing this prophet that had come in, I didn't know the prophet, a man from Dallas. But he said, let's go to the prayer room and see if the Lord will speak to this. And I was afraid to go in there. And you know what God spoke to me? He didn't tell me that this is a true prophet. He didn't tell me you can trust this man. He said, even Balaam couldn't curse what I've blessed. And I went into that prayer room, that prayer closet. In that prayer closet, God confirmed our ministry on that channel. Brother Eldred Thomas followed me outside when I left. And he said, Brother Surface, as long as I have anything to do with this station, I want your ministry on this. Because not even Balaam could curse that which God had blessed. But Balaam was a prophet of God who was willing to prophesy for money. You've got enough money, I'll prophesy anything you want to hear. I'll preach anything. If you, whatever will bring the most money, what will fill the church, what will fill the coffers, you know, that is what we'll preach. Whatever it takes to bring in the money. Well, they followed after the way of Balaam, the son of Bozar, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice persuade. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried about with a tempest, to whom the midst of the darkness is reserved forever. The midst of darkness is reserved forever for these preachers it's talking about. Uh, uh, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought into bondage. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they're entangled, they're in again, and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they've known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it's happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed into her wallowing in the mire. Now then, you cannot read this second chapter of Second Peter without seeing the prosperity ministry and preachers of the modern church. Those that get on television and tell you if you'll send me a thousand dollars, God will repay you a hundredfold. Those became filthy rich through their covetousness, you know, through their feigned words, great swelling words, they became filthy rich, some living in mansions of 10 and 15 million dollars. One in particular, I saw his mansion on, on YouTube. His bedroom was three times bigger than my house. 4,500 square foot bedroom. Oh my. And what a shame. That house was $14 million in value. And oh my, oh my, oh what a horrible reward awaits that man who's still telling people, send me a thousand dollars and God will send you a hundredfold, make you rich. That man didn't become rich by giving. He got rich by receiving by de deceiving 
and receiving. Oh my, the scripture says he and others, hundreds of them in the church across the land that preach for money, he said they'll receive the same reward as a street mugger. The same reward as those that hold a gun in your back and give me your wallet. Except, except those that hold a gun in your back as quick as you're gone. That they're gone. You know, they got your money, but you're not in fear of your life anymore. But these hold the people in bondage through their unfeigned words. They not only take your money this week, they'll take it next week and the next week and the next week. You'll send it to them. They'll enrich themselves and not use it to preach the gospel or to spread the gospel. Oh my, oh my. I'm telling you the hottest part of hell is reserved for such as that. But if God spared not the angels that sinned, how's he going to spare the people that sin, that continue in sin? How's he going to spare them? How, how's it going to happen? I read a, an article the other day by what I've always considered a good man, one of my favorite writers in charisma. Now that's, that's in charisma, that kind of, that kind of uh, uh, levels things out. Favorite writers in charisma doesn't have to be that great. But, uh, and I'm a writer in charisma. But, uh, but he's talking about uh, Easter, what Jesus suffered, and how unfair it was, you know, because he took our punishment, you know. And I'm fixing to write another article for charisma, and the scripture is going to be for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God for the joy. What was the joy set before him? His joy was not to take the punishment for the ungodly. His joy was not to take the punishment for people if they would just believe in him. His joy is not to make peace with sin so that heaven will be filled with sinners because he took their punishment. That was not the joy that was set before him. The joy that was set before him was the redemption to take away the sin of the world, to bear our sin in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, would live unto righteousness. Hallelujah. So clear in the scriptures that the most brilliant of our theologians cannot see it. But oh my, oh my precious Savior, precious Savior, I want to leave this thought for a few minutes and I want to come over to Ephesians, the third chapter. I've got 15 minutes and only half a message preached. And every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, gave gifts unto men. What were the gifts of, he gave to men? It was gifts of Christ. Did you see that in the seventh verse? Grace given to us according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And he gave gifts unto men. Now he that, that he ascended, what is it that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up to above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Look at that, fill all things. He's not talking about things. He's talking about people. He's talking about believers. He sent it on high so he could fill you with the Holy Ghost. Did you hear that? If I depart, I will send him unto you. Praise God. He sent it up on high that he might fill all. Precious Savior. Hallelujah. Back in that first chapter of Ephesians, talks about Jesus. God has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. He filleth all. Hallelujah. 
He ascended upon high that he might, that he might uh, fill all. 11th verse. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. When did he give these? Well, he appointed 12 apostles before, before he died on the cross. And what happened? Well, one of them betrayed him. One of them denied that he ever knew him. All of them forsook him. None of them believed that he raised from the dead. So really, when he appointed men to be his apostles, that didn't make them apostles. When did he give apostles? Well, he ascended on high and gave gifts unto men. He didn't give apostles until he descended up on high that he might fill all things. Hallelujah. And so he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And he gave them when he sent the Holy Ghost upon the 120. And in the Holy Ghost, the scripture says, for the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. That's talking about every person that has received the Holy Ghost. The manifestation of the Spirit is given unto them. Every person that receives the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to have to covet earnestly that gift. You're going to have to seek God daily for that gift, for that manifestation. Praise. It's not as though He gives it. No, this is mine. I can use it anytime I want to. You've got millions of people babbling in a prayer language that's never received the Holy Ghost. But they think they can turn it on and turn it off at will. It does absolutely nothing for them. Listen to me. Listen to me. But for the manifestation of the Spirit, healings and miracles and all the wonderful manifestations of God, as well as these apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, it doesn't matter if, if you're an apostle. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to be daily at that fountain drinking, at daily at that table eating, or you're not going to have the ministry of an apostle alive and working in you. Praise God. Hallelujah. God spoke to me in 1966, September. He said, I've set you to be a watchman among my people. There came a time, uh, maybe a year later, I don't know what it was, but I said, well, that's what I am, so that's what I'm going to do. When I set out to do what I am, I made the biggest mess of things you can imagine. Praise God. Because a watchman can't see nothing if God doesn't show it to him. If it doesn't come. I'm not saying that I'm there at the right time. I happen to overhear Sister Spook and Doc giving the gossip on, on Sister Doolittle. You know, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about sneaking around corners and, and, and uh, eavesdropping. I'm not talking about that. He said what you hear in the ear at night. He's talking about what God speaks in the words. He gives what you see in the visions of that night. He said that shout from the housetops. That's not going to happen if you're not seeking the Lord and daily renewed, precious Savior. But you'll find out that if you ever receive the Holy Ghost and the God ever worked through you in a wonderful and powerful way, if you will return to the Lord and seek His face, He'll do it again. He'll do it again. I was praying last week. I'm going to tell something. I shouldn't foolish to do it. But I was remembering the outpouring of the Spirit of three years ago, almost three years ago that God gave us right here. And I was crying, God, do it again. God, do it again. God, do it again. And I remembered, while I was praying, I remembered something. At that time, I was fasting a day and a half every week. And, uh, and for health reasons, I quit. For health reasons, I quit. And suddenly, my prayer changed. My prayer changed. It was no longer, God, do it again. It was, God, I'll do it again. I'll do it again. I'll do it again. I'll do it again. I'll seek your face. 
I'll fast before you. I'll seek your face. I'm not trying to earn anything, you know, when we fast, but a hunger for the things of God more than a hunger for the things of this life. Hallelujah. To see a move of God. But here he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of saints, for the work of the ministry that are found in the body of Christ. The modern church has set the apostles and prophets and evangelists in mansions and supposedly has those there mentoring to go out and do the work of the ministry. That is deception. That is a lie. It's God that gives the ministries. It's God that anoints the ministries. It's God that sends the ministries. And if they want to sit in their ivory palaces and think they're doing the work of God, they will be turned into hell. Listen to me. Because every apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher was given not to prepare others to do it for them, but to do that work of the ministry. As long as there's breath in this body, to do the work that God has given to us individually to do. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we be henceforth no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. There would be no more children. That word children from the Greek means not speaking, but it's translated children, little babies, before the age of speaking. He said, talking to the church, that you won't be newborn babies forever, but you'll grow up into him. But he used the word not speaking, not speaking. Those that are not speaking, the babies, tossed to and fro, but carried about by every wind of doctrine, because you don't know the truth that makes you free. When you know the truth, nothing can turn you from it. Nothing can turn you from it when you know the truth that makes free. You can't believe. You can't not believe it. You can't believe something else. Regardless the threat of your life, if you're to die in the next minute, if you denied the truth of Christ, you would have to just die the next minute. Let them take your life. I say, that's not a command. I'm just saying within you, you could not deny Christ. You could not do it. It, it just not, wouldn't be in you to do it. If you could deny him, you never knew him. If you could deny him, you never saw him as he is. Precious Savior. Carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love. And one day, I, I, I saw that speaking the truth in love is, is, uh, takes us back to that word for children, they're not speaking. They're not speaking. Oh, I'm a believer, but I'm ashamed to tell anybody. I'm a believer, but I'm sure not going to let them believe that, 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 you know, that, that he took our sin away. I'm sure not going to let people know that I believe that, uh, that, that you know, he made us free from sin. Oh, no, no. Uh, and, and you're going to be tossed back and forth. You're going to be confused. You're going to be, you're going to be deceived by the slight of men, cunning craftiness. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him. You'll be a not speaker, a babe, as long as you're ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As long as you're ashamed to speak it where it's not believed. You'll be a baby. You'll be confused. You'll be tossed to and fro, listen to me, seeking the fellowship of man rather than the approval of Christ or more than the approval of Christ. Oh my, but speaking the truth in love, wherever you are, speak the truth, speak the truth in love. Hallelujah. 
may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of the part of every measure of every part. What is that measure? It's that measure of the gift of Christ. An apostle has received a certain measure of Christ. Of Christ, a certain measure. Well, say, I have Christ in my heart. But we're talking about ministry. Ministry. Apostle received a certain measure. Maybe the largest measure of that gift of Christ. The prophet, another measure. The evangelist, another measure. The pastor and teacher, another measure of the gift of Christ. Oh, my. But here he says, from whom the whole body fitly joined together, compacted by that which every joint supplieth. Do you know every one of us is a joint? Every one of us is a joint in a body. Every one of us is a member in a body. Hallelujah. And precious Savior. Hallelujah. Compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. The effectual working is talking about the working of the Holy Ghost in you. The effectual working. Uh, Paul, back in the third chapter, he said, seventh verse, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. That's the Holy Ghost working in us. It's the Holy Ghost working in us who have received the Holy Ghost. According to the effectual working of His power, precious worketh in the measure of every part, making the increase of the body, the edifying of itself in love. I was preaching Wednesday night. I wanted to get back there today. I got two minutes. I was preaching Wednesday night from the verse in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Where it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. After the manner of so much, some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I'll tell you something. Our tendency to not assemble is destroying not only the church. It's destroying our nation. But you cannot assemble with something that does not believe or know the truth. You don't fit. You'll never fit. You'll never fit. Praise God. Only if you're free to stand up and speak the truth in love. If you're not free to do that, get away from it. Get away from it. Continue your search for a church. Praise God. Continue your search for a church. Because there are those that are seeing the truth. That are being transformed by the truth. There's many. There's many across the the nation at this time that are beginning to see that truth of the gospel. And if you're, oh, if you're within driving range of Calvary Outreach in Conroe, come on over. Come on over. Some of you are watching the streaming almost every service, you know, within driving distance. And some of you I haven't seen in 30 years but you used to be a part of this ministry. I'm inviting you to come back and assemble with us. But I'm speaking to people of our own congregation that have found it's easier to stay at home and watch it on the phone. Oh my, and the body sits incomplete. I, I saw this not in a vision from the Lord, not in a, this would be, I guess, a vision of our own heart. But I saw the young men, some of them that come back from the war, some of them have no arms 
and no legs. I've seen them. Just a stump of a body and a head. That's all there is. They can talk. Somebody's got to feed them. Somebody's got to bathe them. Somebody's got to clothe them. Somebody's got to do everything for them. And they can do nothing for themselves. They're just a stump. No arms, no legs. You say, how pitiful, how pitiful. When the body does not assemble, it becomes very much like that stump of a man that can only talk, that only has a voice, that can only talk. Mine, of course, is some that can't even talk. They're no more than a vegetable. That's what they used to call them. Unpolitically correct. But what a sad thing. What a sad thing. When the body of Jesus Christ, because people would rather stay home than to assemble. Listen to me. You're destroying the church and you're destroying the nation. You say, I don't make the connection. Oh, it's here. It's here. Precious Savior, the only hope of the nation is the church. Precious Savior. Church, we can be. And I'm not calling the building a church, but the building is the place the church assembles. You remember that? The church building is the place the church assembles. The church is the body of of Christ the true church the fullness of him that filleth all in all hallelujah and we sit here with the greatest truth with the key that opened the kingdom of heaven to men we sit here how with the weapons of our warfare that will cast down every imagination and pull down every stronghold and we sit here We sit here and refuse to assemble. Refuse to assemble. Oh, we've got so many things that we've got to do. You know, but you don't understand it. You're being moved away. You're being drawn away. You're being moved away. Other desires begin to spring up. Other things become vines that choke that choke a child of God out, that choke the life of them, that pull on them. Oh, my, oh, my precious Savior. Hallelujah. Some of you listening from other states and other nations, and I put a heavy burden upon you this morning, the burden of speaking the truth in love wherever you are. If you see what this preacher's preaching, I'm talking about from the gospel. Who Christ is. What he came into the world to do. That he did it perfectly. When he died upon the cross. That those who believe that truth. And trust in him. Are made free from sin. The struggle's over. Praise God. If they'll speak the truth in love. You say I don't like the conflict. I don't like the anger I get. I don't like. Oh my. Shake the dust off of your feet. And go down the road. For until you find somebody that wants to, what you've got to say. Precious Savior. Precious Savior. I know that's hard. I know, but I'm telling you, not only is the church of Jesus Christ at stake, in, in danger of becoming an invalid body without an arms and legs. Precious Savior. It's only when we're assembled. It's only when you're assembled. You know, you, you buy. So many things. I got a couple of, uh, of, uh, of lavatories, uh, uh, vanity cabinets to install. You read on that package, it'd say assembly required. Assembly required. How many things do you buy at the store? And it says on the box, assembly required. I'm going to tell you something about the church of Jesus Christ. Assembly required. It does not assemble under one roof at one time to worship God in the Spirit. Hallelujah. It'll be an invalid. It'll perish. 
It'll go by the wayside. Less than 50% of Americans are a part of the church today. Assembly required. God bless you. Let's stand to our feet together. Folks, let's actually find a place to pray for.